please remove any metallic items you're carrying, keys, loose change. Holy shit! Back up! Stand back up! So now we've animated all our characters using Story Tool, the next thing we're going to do is animate some props. And if we're going to be animating props, then we're going to need constraints. Now we're not going to be animating simple parent-child constraint where we just have one object requires one parent object. What we're going to be doing here are objects that require multiple parent objects, so props that are getting picked up, put down, taken out, thrown away, or that are held between multiple objects. And luckily in Motion Builder there's one constraint that can do all of this. But before we can do any of that, we need to plot our animation from Story Tool onto our characters. So once we're happy with all the animation in story, what we need to do is transfer this into a take, because currently all this animation and all the camera cuts and everything only exist in story. So if we turn this off, we can see if we move through, obviously there's the animation that's in the scene at the beginning on the camera. You can see now we don't have our camera cuts. If we control Q into our perspective view, you can see all our characters are down here at our offset origin, not doing anything. So what we need to do is bake all the animation onto our characters and also all the shot track information here onto our camera switcher. So to do that we're going to turn story back on and we're going to control I back into the camera switcher, move back to the first frame. So the first thing we're going to do is plot our shot track onto our camera switcher. So to do that we can right click here and then we're just going to use plot selected shot track to camera switcher and we're going to plot that into take one. We can click yes, and that's converted all that shot track information. If we go down into camera, camera switcher, it's added all that shot track information into the camera switcher and set up all the keys. So now if we turn off story and play back, we can see it's now all the cuts have transferred from story onto our camera switcher. So the next thing we need to do is plot the animation onto our characters. Now to do this, there are a couple of options. You can actually right click on here and use plot whole scene to current take. I'm not a big fan of this option because it tends to plot animation on every object and there's keyframes all over the place and it's very difficult to manage them where your keyframes have been set and going around and finding things. So what I prefer to do is come into the actual characters and then we can select our character and then we can plot character, create a control rig and plot it to the FKIK and then in here we're going to plot at 24 frames a second. We can use the unroll filter and then we can hit plot. So now if we look at our guard number one, if we turn off story, we can see when this plays back, you can see we've got our guard number ones in place, these animations moving. So what you can do now is you can just go through and do the same thing. So plot character, create a control rig, create an FKIK and do that. Or if you've got a lot of characters like we have in here, we can turn story back on. What you can do is you can script this. So if we go up here into window, Python editor. So I've got a script here that's going to do all that for us. So basically what this does is for every track in this story track root folder, it'll check if the types of character animation track, which these are, and then it'll grab the character from the track. So it'll use these. So if it's not set to plot to skeleton, it's going to check if there's a control rig. If there isn't a control rig, it's going to create a control rig, which is creating the FKIK control rig the same way as we just did in the options window. And then we're going to plot animation, and then we're going to plot it to the control rig, and we're going to use these plot options, which is the same as a little plot options window. So you're going to plot all takes as false, plot on a frame, plot every frame, plot translation on root only. We're going to set the rotation filter to unroll. We're going to use turn constant key reducer off, and we're going to keep one keyframe if we did have constant key reducer on. So now we can run that. So that's now you can see here starting to turn these off. So this is just going to go through each one of these character tracks, create a control rig, plot the animation to it and then move on to the next one and turn off the tracks as it does. So this is going to turn off the track and then this is going to turn off story as a whole. So now we can close that 
and then in here if we play this back we can see we've got all our characters animated so now we're ready to start adding in some props so the first prop we're going to look at is this rather wonderfully modeled bag that I made so what we're going to do first is in elements I'm going to add in a null so we're just going to put this in and I'm going to center this in the scene so I'm going to use this as the root for the bag and then I'm going to create another null and drag that in and we'll center that one as well and this one I'm going to put up onto the handles and then I'll explain why in a moment we're just going to arrange all horizontally so this is our we're going to rename this to root and then we're going to rename this to handles and then we're going to take our handle press p to go into parenting mode we're going to parent the handles to the root and then we're going to parent the bag to the handles and we can arrange this vertically so now you can see we've got a root for our prop object so this means if we need to move the entire scene there's usually a node at the center of the scene so it just means we can grab this and move this entire thing around and then to animate our prop we're going to animate on this handles locator so now we can move our bag around and then we've got our geometry underneath that so the reason I've parented the geometry of this bag to this null is so I can come in here and I can put all the animation on this null and then if we need to update the geometry for this bag or the prop changes or it, then we need to change something about it the animation still exists I can just delete this geometry out and replace it with the new one and parent it back to this null that has all the animation on so it's just an easy way to quickly update this because usually something will change with this somewhere in production somebody will change the bag or it'll change slightly uh, and this is just a good way of making sure that they, you don't lose the animation that you've created so now we've got our nulls we can just set up the rest of the scene uh, so we can come in to our navigator we've already got our bag in a namespace so we can just add the handles and the root to the bomb bag namespace and then the other thing we're going to do is create a set of groups so that if we've got this in the scene we can quickly find these nulls so we can create a root handles and then we'll put the geo in here as well and then we can combine all these into one thing so now I can quickly turn that all on and off if I want to make sure that I can't pick the geometry I can just turn that off in there and then if I need to grab the handles I can quickly grab hold of them and then if I need to grab the root same thing again I can just quickly grab hold of that and move everything around so this is just an easy way to organize your scene so that you can find everything because as you see as we start adding in more props and things it gets a lot harder to start picking these things so having them down here in groups it makes it a lot easier so now we can come down here into groups and then we're just going to select these groups the reason I'm not selecting them over here is obviously because this actually selects the objects so if I try and add a namespace to these, it's going to namespace all the objects as well. So if we shift D to deselect everything, we can come down here and grab all geo handles and root. And we can right click, add remove namespace, and then we can select bomb bag. And hit OK. So now we've got everything namespaced. We can save this and then we're going to import this into our scene. Now I'm going to use exactly the same setup for the rest of the props, but obviously we're not going to sit and go through them. But the idea is you have a root in the scene so you can always move all your animation and props and everything around with the rest of the scene and then you keep the animation on a null or you could use a, a different object but what you want to do is make sure that your animation is on a separate object not on the main geometry of your prop otherwise like I say if that gets updated or that needs to be changed you're going to lose all your animation whereas if it's on a null you can simply unparent this bring in the new mesh and then reparent it to the null and you're ready to go again so now back in our scene, we can file merge our prop in. So in here we want all the elements. We don't want any animation. We don't want any of the cameras or transport settings. And we don't want any of the takes. 
we can merge that in. So now we can go back into one view and then down here if we come into our groups and come down to our bomb bag, if we select bomb bag all and just go into control Q into perspective view and hit F, our frame is on our bomb bag. So you can see that comes in at the center of the scene. So then we can grab our handles and we're just going to offset this with the rest of the characters and things that we did in the last video. So we're going to come over here to Y and we're going to set this to minus 999. And if we hit F, you can see that's put it down at this center. So we can leave that there for now. So that's all set up like a lot of the other characters. Now the next thing to do is set up our constraint. So because this bag gets passed around by quite a few people, if we come back up into our control I back into our camera switcher. If we actually watch this through, we've got Nigel carrying the bag in here. Just hide those skeletons. We've got Nigel carrying the bag in here. He puts it on the conveyor belt. And it moves with the conveyor belt. All this happens. And then just here, Tracy's going to come in and she's going to pick it up from the conveyor belt and walk forward with it. So what we want to do is pass this bag between quite a few characters and the conveyor belt. So to do that, rather than using parent-child constraints and animating the different weights and things, we're going to come down into constraints and I'm going to use a multi-referential constraint. So if we just drag that into the scene and then I'll explain how this works. So a multi-referential constraint has, it's like a parent-child constraint but with a lot more options. So you have a rigid object which is like the child object and then you have parent objects. And a good thing about a multi-referential constraint is you can have multiple parent objects and then over here in the key controls where it says ref you can actually change the parent and set a keyframe so it actually animates the transition between the different parent objects so it'll become clearer when I actually show this so if we go back into our perspective view and then come down into groups go into our bomb bag now before I start dropping things in here because this viewport's going to change every time I click on something so that that doesn't happen what we're going to do is we're going to lock this viewport so if we just come down here to this little padlock icon that means now if I select anything this won't change so it means we can grab everything and drag it in without this keep changing so if we come down to our bomb bag handles let's just shift D to deselect everything grab our bomb bag handles and we're going to alt drag this into our rigid object so that's going to be our child object and then we can go and find our first parent object up here we're going to switch to Nigel, grab his hand and hit F so you can zoom in on that. So you can see here as Nigel comes in we want the bag to go with his hand so we're going to use this left wrist controller we're going to alt drag that in as the first parent object and the second object we want to move with is this conveyor belt so he puts it on there and at this point it moves along with the conveyor belt so what we can do here is if we come down into asset browsers elements we can grab a null and we're just going to drop that let's put it on here so it's close by let's just drag this roughly into position so we're going to use this as our conveyor belt so if we put that somewhere around there and then if we just come down into this scene navigator because it's easier to find we can rename that so now with our conveyor belt selected we can alt drag that in that's going to be our second parent object it doesn't matter what order you put things in here so I'm just doing them in the order that I actually need them because it's a good way to check that you've got everything in but they can be in any order so you can add other objects in later on if you need to uh, and go back because you actually set the order with this drop down here so you don't have to worry about putting them in a certain order here I'm just doing it because it makes logical sense as I'm going through so it goes along the conveyor belt conveyor belt will move it along and then at this point Tracy's going to come in and she's going to come over and grab the bag with her left hand so we can grab hold of Tracy's left hand controller and we're going to bring that in and put that in as our third parent object. So now we can just check that we've got everything in here. 
So if we go back to the start, we've got our left Nigel's left wrist controller, where he's carrying it in here. Puts it down on a conveyor belt, so we're going to have our conveyor belt. And then it moves along with the conveyor belt, and then at this point, after all this, Tracy's going to come in, she's going to pick it up with her left hand, so we've got her left wrist controller, and then she's going to walk forward with it, and that's the end of the scene. So now we can turn that constraint on, just hit snap, and then if we go back to our groups, bomb bag handles, and then just hit F, you can see our bomb bag's still at the center. That's because if we look down here in the key controls, we can see it's actually using the bomb bag handles as the parent, so it's actually going to follow those. So if we move these around, we can see that moves the bomb bag. So what we're going to do first is we're going to go to our camera switcher and we're just going to move along until we see Nigel enter here. So that's 158, so we set our frame range. So he walks in and then the bomb bag goes down through. And then the bomb bag goes to about, let's call it 300. So you can hit 300. So that's just going to focus our timeline in, our transport controls, so that we're just looking at this section for now. So if we control Q into our perspective view, and then come up here and grab Nigel's hand, we're just going to use that to focus the camera and go back over here. So what we want is, we're going to put an animation layer in. So I'm going to do all my animation on animation layer 1, because all the base animation is all the control rig, all the raw motion capture. So I'm going to keep that as my base layer. And then I'm going to do all my animation because I'm going to be doing animating all the control rigs on layer 1. So what I don't want to do is put keys on the base layer for the other things that I'm going to animate and then have to remember that some things are on base animation, some things are on animation layer 1 and, or create another animation layer. I like to, as much as I can, just work on two layers so it's less confusing for my tiny brain. So we're going to go to animation layer 1 and then... If we just double click this slider by it expands it back out we're going to move back a frame so at this point if we select our if we shift D to deselect everything select our bomb bag handles we can set a keyframe because we want them to be down there at zero for now and then if we move back forwards a frame we can say at this point we want them to be aligned with his with Nigel's left hand so if we control A to show that we can alt left click drag and then use align translation rotation so that puts them in the right position and then we can double click our bar again that focuses the timeline back in to where we had before so now we can zoom in and we're just going to position this bag so we're going to f5 into local space just rotate this bag into roughly into position so it looks like he's holding it now we've got our bag in position, we can say we want Nigel's wrist to be the parent object. So if we come down here into key controls, reference, look in this drop down, we can see we've got Nigel's wrist effector. So if we do that, it sets a key here. So now if we move forwards, you can see that starts to move with Nigel's wrist. And then if we just expand that back out, if we go back a frame, you can see it's not been, we select our bomb bike handles again. You can see our bomb bag's still back at zero on this frame. And then it jumps out there, back into his hand. So you can see there you've animated, what you're doing there is animating the parent object that it's going to follow. So this is a really good way of animating if you've got a prop that you need to pass around between hands or between multiple people or pick up and put down. It's a great way of doing those kind of things because you can just animate at which point it switches over. So now we can see, we just move out a little bit. Let's just hide some of this environment. So now if we watch Nigel, you can see he carries the bag, puts it over here on the scanner, and then obviously at that point we want him to put that down and move on. So if we just focus back in on our section again, so as he brings the bag forward, we can say at this point, he puts the bag down, so let's say Two six seven. So let me see that's not quite lined up. So what we're going to do 
ears come into Nigel, grab his wrist and just put that bag in the correct position. So sometimes when you first use the control rig you'll find you can't actually move something and that's usually because it's in selection mode which means you can only actually move one point and because this is an IK chain and it needs to be able to move the whole arm you can't actually move this so what you need to do is put it into body parts so you can control this whole arm. So that's a common thing I see people getting stuck with. So now he can grab his hand. So another thing I'm going to quickly change is, you can see here when he moves, when I start moving his arm around, it changes the rotation on his wrist. So what I'm going to do first is, I'm just going to pin the rotation and translation on his wrist. So now when I move it, that rotation isn't going to change, so I can position his hand, drop in the bag on the conveyor belt. and not have to worry if I move this it stays the rotation on the wrist stays the same if I just take that off using W and E you can see when I move this the rotation of the wrist changes and the bag starts moving around so if I W and E it'll pin the translation and rotation so you can just put that in position it's just an easier way of moving things around it's a little bit like switching the controls between local and global space so if we put the bag on the edge of the conveyor belt, something like this, and then we can just make it look a little bit more like he's lifting this bag up. If we're happy with that, we can hit key. And now because this has created an offset from his original position, so this is the offset we've just created. If we turn that off, you can see that's the position that it was originally on. That's the position it's at now. What we need to go back and do is, at this point where he lifts his arm up, let's say just here so that it doesn't lift it super high you can see here he's going really high on this lift because originally it was a lot lower but we've moved it up to get his hand onto this conveyor belt so if we say here we can hit a zero key that's going to put it back to its original position and then we can move this into position so it looks like he's lifting it up onto the conveyor belt and we can key that and then if we come back down to here where he starts to lift his arm up, set a zero keyframe and then for this one we just need to make sure that it's not intersecting with his body so this is where he starts to lift the bag up so I'm just going to move that around until it's not intersecting his body anymore and then we can keyframe on that and then the last bit will just come back down to here where we start to see him walk and then on this one, we'll just move this out again, just so that bag's not intersecting with his body. And set a keyframe. So now we've got our Nigel character walks in, picks up the bag, and puts it on the conveyor belt. Now, from this point forward, he shouldn't be holding the bag. We want to connect that to the conveyor belt. So we can go to this frame. We can grab our conveyor belt and all, and we'll just move that back. So we're going to put some animation on this. So if we put that roughly where we want this to start moving, we can set a keyframe. And then if we come back down here into key controls, we can say we want the bag now to be controlled by the conveyor belt. So then at this frame, it's going to set a keyframe here that's going to move it and switch the parent. So now you can see as we had before, he comes up and puts it down and now at this point it's connected to the conveyor belt. So now if we grab our conveyor belt null, we can move this forward, set a keyframe, and if we just check that out and go back to the beginning and just play that back. You can see Nigel walks in carrying the bag, lifts it up, puts it on the conveyor belt. The conveyor belt moves quite quickly, but you can see then the bag moves with the conveyor belt. So let's just expand that out. So if we come down into F curves, we can grab our translation Z. And look, so the other thing that we need to do, because this conveyor belt's running, you wouldn't have this slow in and slow out. You'd expect it to just be a, a linear speed. So we can set the interpolation between, we can just select these two keyframes and set the interpolation to linear.
So that's going to keep it moving straight. So we could, if we look at that, we want it to be moving a little bit slower. So let's try something like 360. So we can just come down here, change this value to 360. That's going to set our new keyframe. We can grab the others and move them there. And then play that back. So you can see our bag goes through our bag scanner and stops at the end. So now the last thing to do is come down here to where Tracy comes in. She's going to walk over and pick the bag up here and then walk forwards. So let's just focus in on this section. So if we say 1090, what's that? 1200. So now we're sort of going to do the reverse than what we did to Nigel. So for Nigel, we positioned the bag using Nigel's control rig and then connected the bag to the conveyor belt. But this time what we're going to do is we're going to have Tracy come over. We're going to change Tracy's animation so it matches where the bag is now. And then connect the bag to her wrist. So where she comes in and grabs the bag here. If we just look. So usually if somebody picks something up, there's like a stop because there's a change in direction. So she'll put a hand here, stop for a couple of frames, and then turn. Say 120. See there, it stops and then starts to turn. So we use 120 as a frame where she's going to grab it. So if we set a keyframe there, we've not actually done anything. I just want to make a mark. And if we go back here to where she starts to lift a hand up. So I'm going to do is set a keyframe here. So what I want to do is move a hand into the right position to hold this bag. But what I want to do is hide the transition from where she goes from her original position to this new offset in, a, in the actual motion of her moving her hand. So where she picks her hand up here, I want it to be in the correct position when it gets to the bag here. So the other thing I'm going to do is just move this bag forward slightly so we can grab our conveyor belt and then we're just going to grab the Z. I'm just going to move that forward so that her hands, so that it's closer to her hand. And the other thing we'll do is we'll just animate this bag into the correct position. So now where she grabs all of the bag, we can go to our Tracy control rig, grab a hand. I'm just going to switch to F6 to global. And then I'm just going to position her hand on the bag so that it looks like she's actually grabbing hold of it. And then we can set a keyframe. So now if we go back, we can see it goes from our original position. It now comes up to this new offset position where she grabs hold of the bag. And then what we can do here is we can open the hand and then close the hand on this frame. So you can just grab these fingers, rotate this around, key those, and then move a hand into position on this handle, key that. Obviously with this you'd spend a little bit more time getting these poses, but for now this sort of shows the important bits. So you've got our hand comes up from its original position, grabs hold of the bag, and then from this point we want this bag to start moving with Tracy's hand. So to do that we can come down into our key controls again and we can just change this from conveyor belt to Tracy's left wrist. So now you can see it's with the conveyor belt and then at this point she grabs hold of the bag and it starts moving with her hand. So whenever you're using the referential constraint, what you need to do is make sure when you change the parent object that you've got the props lined up where they need to be because it's going to use that as a sort of offset that you'd normally set in like a parent constraint. It actually animates that value. So you need to make sure when you change these, you've got the props and the hands or the object that you're going to grab hold of and the object that you're grabbing with lined up. So just like we did here, we align Tracy's hand with the bag so that it picks it up smoothly and then moves it off to here where she's moved it away. So now if we come through here to where she, just before she jumps into the next scene, let's just see if we can fix this up so it looks like she's holding it. So if we zero that, we can see where it was originally. So what we can do is we can use this position, just lift this bag up slightly keyframe that position but we can still come down into our bomb bag and then on the handles we can rotate this as though the handles are moving inside a hand 
just to get this back in the correct position. So you can see here she starts to lift the bag and it moves away. And then if we look at that control I and R camera switcher, so this is the angle that we're looking at it from, we can start to go in here now and just fix that animation so that she doesn't intersect with the side of the scanner. And then obviously for this sequence, we just switch back to our control Q back into our perspective view. If we move forward to where it jumps over, we can grab Tracy's hand. We zero that out. So at this point, what we want is her to be holding this so it's on the conveyor belt. Control line to our switcher view. So you can see we could probably get away with a few things here. So if we do two views, switch this to our perspective view, we can go ahead and fix this for the camera because you can't actually see she stood in the middle of this machine because of the way the camera's positioned so you can get something that looks like she's holding it here set a keyframe and then as she drops the bag here we can set another zero key we can probably move those bag handles around as well so you can key those and we've fixed Tracy's hand. So now if we look at that in the window, see the camera we're looking at, you can see she lifts the bag forwards and drops it down. But the idea here is you can see, if we now look at this through our camera switcher, you can see we've got our Nigel character walks in, the bag's on his hand, he puts it on the conveyor belt, the bag moves with the conveyor belt. Let me go through all this section. And then we can see here, we've got our bag still stuck in place at the end of the conveyor belt. We do all this, then Tracy comes in, she walks over, grabs the bag and moves it off. And if we look now, I just did the rest of the props in a very similar way. So the two guns that Nigel's holding, what I did for these was, brought them in and then used this position where he grabs hold of them. So if we look at Nigel here, we can see what I did here was animated the hands round and then put the guns actually in his hands at this point where he grabs hold of them and then use that to set the position of the hands and the gun in his belt so then he draws the guns here and brings them out puts them down by his side and then if we look at the constraint you can see here this section it follows his hips so that's so so back here as he walks in and goes through the scanner and all this business at the beginning you can see they just follow his hips so they stay in place because he doesn't actually have a holster and then when he gets to this point at the end and he opens up his jacket obviously I've animated his hands but I can't animate the jacket at this point here where he grabs hold of the guns they then switch from following his hips to following his hands and then between those I animated the actual gun itself and his hands so that they come out of his belt properly and he puts his guns down and then similar effect for the mp5s here so at the end of this sequence he actually throws them down so I actually go back to using the root and if we control Q into perspective view you can see I've just animated these on the actual root of the object so there's just animation on here that just moves them out of the way and they go through the floor because you never see them again. And they're following the route and then just before that they're following his hands. And then if we go back to where he actually draws these when he comes through the scanner. They're just down at the centre. And then here, same as we did with the bag they pop up into his hands because in the film you don't actually see him draw these they just appear in his hands from this point forward as he starts shooting everything so then they move with his hands and then at this point where he throws them down I just animated them out of the way and then he grabs the new guns there and then the same with Tracy with her gun where she comes in here it's attached to her hand and then where she throws it away here same as I did with the MP5 
as she lets go of it there, I just animated it out of the way. But you don't see it, so it just needs to move out of her hand. And you can see with the constraint, at this point it's following a wrist effector, and then it just switches to the Uzi route. So for this last bit, we're going to look at setting this radio up to this guard. So the gun's done exactly the same way as all the other guns. It's just constrained to his wrist because it basically moves around with him for this whole section. So you don't need to worry about changing that. But this radio, we're going to do something a little bit different, a little bit more complicated. So what we want here is the hand to follow the radio and the radio to follow his head. And then at this point where he looks over to the door, we want the radio to stay with his hand and then to move back to his head. So we want this radio to keep switching different bits. And we also want this hand to stay constrained to the, to the radio so that everything moves together. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to constrain this radio to his left wrist and his head. So we're going to come down here into constraints. We're going to grab our multi-referential constraint. And we're going to constrain the radio. And then in here, we're going to drag in the guard's left wrist. And then we're also going to drag in the head and hit snap. So now what we want to do is position this so that we've got this relation between the radio, his head and his hand all set up nicely. So if we go with something like that, we can fix these fingers later. So now if we grab our guard, we're just going to set a key on him because we know this position is correct for moving around with his hand holding the radio. So what we want to do now is say we want the radio to follow his head. So on this frame we're going to set the head as a parent. We're going to switch a view, we can use the camera we've got set up. So you can see now we've got the radio following his head, which is sort of what we want. So what we want now is the hand to follow the radio. So rather than take this wrist controller and just parent that to the radio and have it follow it around here, what I'm going to do is create an auxiliary effector. So the way the auxiliary effector works is it gives you like another controller you can use. So we can see here, if I start to move this away, this auxiliary effector isn't actually moving it stays fixed because we've got IK blend so it's basically using the IK that's on this auxiliary effector. If I turn this off it goes back and follows the original controller for the wrist. So that moves with the wrist and then if I turn this on it goes back to this auxiliary effector. So what we can do is we can come back to this first frame where it's in the correct position so this is how we want it to move this is how we want the hand to move in relation to the radio. So we can come down here and we can grab a parent-child constraint. And then we can drag our parent-child constraint onto the radio. Or we can grab it from here and I'll drag it in. So this is going to be our parent object. And then we can grab our auxiliary effector. And we're going to drag that in as the child. And then we can hit snap. So now this wrist is going to move and follow that radio around. But if you wanted to go back to the original animation, all we need to do is turn the IK off on the auxiliary effector and it moves back to its original position. So what this allows us to do is when our character comes up here and we want him to look away here, rather than this being locked to his head, what we can do is we can switch back and turn this off and use the animation on his wrist to drive the phone and then have his hand come back into the right position here. So what we could do is we could say as he starts to turn to look at Tracy coming through the door sort of here we want to say we want to be using the animation that's on the wrist so we could select our auxiliary effector turn that off We'll not worry about the position of the wrist for now and then just go back a couple of frames and turn this back on 
So now here we've got the hand following and then at this point we're going to turn that off and have him look to the door so this will allow us to separate that walkie talkie from his head so it doesn't look like it's glued to the side of his head and then we come back to Tracy here so we can set a couple of keyframes here and then when it cuts back to him here we can say we want at this point we want this to be back on so we can set that back to 100 and key those values so now we've got a point where his hand lets go of the walkie talkie and then moves to his head so now what we need to do is animate this hand so as he turns his head we're going to use the animation on the hand to drive the walkie talkie so what we're going to do here is we're going to get a better position on this hand so we can see here you can see where the auxiliary effect is so we can move this back into the same sort of position as it was so that's roughly where we want it to start from I'll just pin his the translation and rotation on his wrist so that it doesn't move and I'll bring his elbow in a little bit out of the wall so we can set a keyframe there. So at this point we want his hand to have come back round into roughly where it should be holding the walkie talkie. So again we could use this auxiliary factor as a correct position and just move that somewhere like there. Set a keyframe. So now we can see this hand as he turns his head, his hand moves slightly slower than his head. So what we can do now is, so that this walkie talkie doesn't look like it's glued to his head, we can go back to our radio constraint. And then we can say, on the radio, at this point, it should be moving with the head, but then where we've turned this off we can switch this back and have this follow the left wrist effector so now as he turns his head the walkie talkie moves with his hand and then goes back to here and then we can say from this point on we want it to move with the head again and then when it comes back in his head will be in the right position and it moves again with his head and we could do the same thing at the end here so we could say at this point we're going to turn this controller off we're going to grab our wrist put that in roughly the same position but maybe just drop that away slightly as though he's moving his hand and keyframe that And we can also keyframe that off. Bring that on so that'll be at 100. And then that drops away. So if he wanted a bit more separation as he brings his hand around, just to get a bit of overlapping action on his hand. Again, so it doesn't look like this is all glued together, his hand, his head and the phone. And then we can come back in here and say from this point, we can say we want the radio to follow his left wrist. So now as he moves his head, we can see that phone drops away. And then as he's moving around, as he turns to look, you just get that separation. So it just stops. When you're doing props, if you're going to have things that move with other things, rather than having everything look like it's glued together, we can use this to create this effect of it moving around. And because we're using that multi-referential constraint like this, you can see it's quite easy just to switch it between different objects to create that overlap so everything doesn't look like it's glued together which is a common thing that you get when people start doing props so now if we look at this through the camera we can see here we've got the hand and the radio all nicely aligned with his head as he's looking around the radio sticks to the side of his head 
then his hand follows that and then at this point where he looks over to the door we can see that radio just moves away slightly and then comes back round and you see the hand keeps moving so you get that nice second reaction as he looks across it doesn't look like it's all glued together and then here as he brings the gun up you can see that hand just falls away and again it creates that impression that he's not holding they're not all glued together and what we could do here is just bring that round slightly so it's still sort of on the ear So you can see his head moves away from it, but his hand stays there because it's leaning against this column here. But it just gives it that overlapping action rather than everything being glued together and nothing really moving around. So as we've seen with the guns, a multi-referential constraint is good for changing an object's parents. So for like with the radio, we can move it between the head and the hand to have it follow around different bits to get this nice little bit of overlapping action here. And then the auxiliary factor, a good when you want to create a sort of grab point and have a hand follower prop. So if we look here, you can see here it's all matched together. If we come to this frame, we grab this auxiliary vector. If we turn this off, you can see this hand's nowhere near where the prop was. If you go to another frame, you can see it moves away. So this is a good way. If you've got a two-handed weapon as well, these are really good for that kind of thing. You can put the auxiliary vector like this and then constrain it to the prop and have that floating around and following the prop and then whenever you need to grab it into position you can just animate the IK blend and it'll follow the prop and then when you don't want it like we have here you can turn it off and use the animation as you would on a normal control rig and then when you want it again just turn it back on and then when you're done if you don't want to keep these auxiliary effects around you can just bake the animation back onto the controller and carry on animating as you would normally. So obviously once you've got all those different constraints working you can go back in and just refine the animation so you can see I've improved the animation where the bag goes on the conveyor belt and then at this point here I've actually created a proxy hand scanner a little bit like I did with the radio for the other guard so this is just a parent-child constraint holding on to this because he never actually lets go of it even when he gets shot. We've got the two guns that we saw earlier and then I've put a newspaper in this guy's hand, well, two bits of card, but it gives the idea of him pulling the paper apart. And then this guy, his gun is just again a multi-referential constraint, so it's constrained to his hips in the holster before he draws it. And then after he's drawn it, it's just in his hand. I think he dies when he keeps hold of the gun. And then we've got our guard here with the radio that we saw, so I've just changed the position so these fingers are actually holding the radio this time. And then back to Tracy lifting the bag off the scanner, leaving the scene, throwing the gun away. And then Nigel changing his two MP5s for two Berettas. So as you can tell from this video, I didn't actually capture any props for this. But the important thing is I was actually holding something that resembled the prop while I was performing the actions. So why bother holding something if you're not going to capture it? Well, the reason is if you're physically holding an object, it changes the way you move. From the tension in your body to the adjustments you make to accommodate the size, shape and weight of the object. Also, before you actually grab hold of something, you start changing the way you move to prepare to pick it up. And then there are actions that you can't physically perform without the object. Think about lifting a heavy box. You can't shift your weight under an imaginary box. You just end up falling over. And it's all these tiny little details that you can't recreate from memory that you need the physical prop for. And it's all these tiny details that will make your performance more believable. So the important thing to remember is, if you need to capture an action that requires a prop, make sure you're holding something, because even though you're not capturing the actual prop, you will capture the effect that it has on your body. So hopefully this video has given you a few ideas of how to tackle those complicated prop interactions. If it has, let me know in the comments below, or hit the like button. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next video, we'll be looking at how we can use a control rig to improve Nigel's Kung Fu skills. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.